Hello everyone, I'm Charlotte Aldrich. I am Director of Public Services and Communities here at the RSA and it's my great pleasure to welcome you here for this evening's very special event. Um, we're delighted to be staging this in partnership with Philips. At the RSA we run a diverse range of health and well-being uh, projects, including in my team, ranging from uh, mental health data projects through to thinking about the social determinants of health and how this impacts on inclusive growth. So lots of very relevant ideas that um, speak to much of the work that we do here, have here in the RSA. And we've got tremendous um, array of expertise here that can uh, share in, in that debate. Just before we begin, just a reminder to put your phones to silent. We're filming tonight and live streaming over the web. So welcome to everybody out there watching online. A reminder that the hashtag is hashtag for living well, and if you'd, like to get, if you'd like to get involved in the discussion on Twitter. Now, as that hashtag suggests, tonight our discussion focuses on the question of how to live healthier um, in an age when average life expectancy is steadily increasing. Though the advances in medicine, healthcare and living standards which have brought us these extra years are of course a good thing, the truth is that many of us view an extension of the lifespan as as much of concern as for celebration. We are too well aware of the mounting pressures on the NHS and squeeze on local authority spending on social care. With many people facing the prospect of spending their later years without the benefit of family support and care, we need to be asking ourselves how now to best prepare for living longer and for doing so as active, engaged and healthy citizens. So we've brought together an expert group of speakers this evening to help tackle this question for us. Joining us we have Anna Dixon, who is Chief Executive of the Centre for Ageing Better, Stephen Eilif, Emeritus Professor of Primary Care for Older People at University College London, Mike Adamson, Chief Executive of the British Red Cross, and Neil Mesher, CEO of Philips and Co-Chair of the Ministerial MedTech Strategy Group. So we're going to hear some opening thoughts from our speakers and then there'll be time for comments and questions afterwards. Um, so very look, I look forward to hearing from your contributions as well as any of those we have online. So without further ado, Anna, let's get started. You're a champion for, for improving later life. What do you see as the key challenges and opportunities for us, both as individuals and as the wider society? Well, I think one of the first challenges is really understanding just how dramatic the changes in life expectancy are. Um, I think we uh, tend to look at our own parents and grandparents and use that as a benchmark. And yet, life expectancy um, has been rising very rapidly. Um, I'll give you one uh, statistic that uh, um, certainly uh, uh, was quite impactful for me, is that a girl born today here in the UK has about a 50% chance of living to 100 so, you know, we, we probably don't know that many centenarians today ourselves, but in the future there are going to be many more. Um, the uh, Queen's uh, birthday cards, uh, the team writing those are going to be getting uh, increasingly busy in coming years. So with these longer lives, definitely uh, there are challenges, and I'm sure we will talk about some of those this evening, but we see there also being a huge opportunity, both for us as individuals to make the most of those longer lives, but also as a society. But the key has to be, we need to switch our focus from the, I suppose, the focus on adding years to life. So there's been, especially in health, um, public health, a focus on increasing life expectancy and reducing um, premature mortality. And to really focus on how can we add life to years. Um, and that includes making sure that we live more years in health and free of disability. So the Centre for Aging Better, when we started out just over a year ago, um, commissioned research to try and understand what makes for a good later life. And I think the message is pretty clear and simple, and it's a message that hopefully uh, is uh, important for every individual here, um, for now and for your future. Um, to have good health, to be financially secure, to be socially connected to others, and to have meaning and purpose in our lives. Unfortunately today, there's huge variation in how people experience later life. That's not a reality for everybody to have a good later life. And certainly some people are more at risk of missing out on a good later life. Um, in our research looking to segment the population over 50, we found a group called the Struggling and Alone. And I think it's very interesting uh, what they had in common. It was not their chronological age that sort of defined them as a group. We had others where there were baby boomers and others. 
Um, it was that they had had a long-standing health condition and this had impacted on their ability to work and their ability to um, therefore uh, make social connections and uh, be financially secure. So I suppose there's sort of uh, very briefly three things that um, I would like to mention in terms of um, you know, how we're going to seize this opportunity of longer lives both as individuals and as a society. I think the first is we do need to focus on supporting healthy ageing and I know others will probably talk more about this but take a life course approach. Of course it's great that we should start early and there's lots of focus on that but I think we also need to get the message out there it's never too late so um, you can still sort of change your um, uh, life course in terms of your later life uh, health um, and prevent for example things like falls uh, which obviously have a very significant impact on people um, in later life uh, things like muscle loss are not inevitable and if people get the right sort of strength and balance exercise that can enable people to remain independent for longer um, so we do need to focus on people's sort of intrinsic capacity and how we maintain their functioning. But WHO in their healthy ageing strategy also talk about the environment and I think it's really important as well as maximising people's function, reducing disability, one of the other things that can help people function for longer is the environment. And the second thing I want to therefore highlight is housing, where we live. Only 5% of current housing is, um, supports independent living. And yet, it's the, the fastest growth in households is in people over 85 over the next sort of 20 years. So the, the challenge there is how do we adapt current housing, how do we ensure we build future uh, homes so that they are suitable to support people to stay uh, well and active as they age. Um, the final area um, that I just sort of would mention is um, how we keep people active and connected um, into later life. And one of the ways can be to help support people to work for longer. Now, lots of people think, well, if we're living longer, of course, we've got to work for longer. Uh, but, you know, how dreadful. <laughs> I, <laughs> I'm ready to retire. But actually, um, we need to rethink careers, working lives, and uh, support people in different ways to potentially retrain, to adapt roles and to think differently about working lives so that they can sustain work uh, for longer. It's also important, obviously, that, that the quality of that work um, sustains people in healthy ways and is suitable um, to them. Um, obviously, um, insecure work and low pay, as um, highlighted by other organisations, is, is not good for health or um, uh, people at any age. Um, Obviously, you know, people will sustain paid work, we think, for longer, and that is um, necessary to make sure people are financially secure, particularly with changes in pensions. Um, but there's part of working that's about purpose, and the other way that people can get that is to think about how um, they might transition from paid work into other community roles and uh, find ways to volunteer or to give their time and talents in other ways. So... Um, we um, at the Centre for Aging Better certainly do see longer lives as an opportunity. Um, um, that's not to deny the fact that for many people it is a challenge. Um, we think that uh, health is critical to that, but there are also other things like where you live and the sort of work you're able to do. So I know that the doom mongers tend to, in the media, tend to focus on the challenges. They talk about the demands on NHS social and social care, the costs of pensions. In fact, these negative views of old age themselves actually make it less likely that people are going to have um, a good later life, plan for it, look forward to it, um, uh, and indeed just having a positive attitude. There's uh, at least some studies have suggested that that can uh, account for a difference in life expectancy, so the more positively we um, uh, look to our later lives. So, yes, let's start early, trying to give everybody the best chance of um, uh, enjoying their longer lives, but there's certainly more to be done uh, to make sure that that's a reality for everyone. Steve, how do we make this a reality for everyone? Because I'm sure it's not evenly distributed in terms of Anna's story about that girl born today with a 50% likelihood of living to 100 Yes. Uh, just think of that for a moment. Uh, think of all those school reunions you'd have to go to. <laughs> um, what about the peer pressure that's supposed to go away as you get older? It would still be there, wouldn't it? 
I, I want to pick up the theme of a life course because I think that helps us understand what's going on. The most of the disability that accumulates in later life arises from damage done in earlier life. So if we want to live long and well and healthy, we should make sure that we are doing all the right things and living in the right circumstances all the way through our lives. And that takes us back to the smoothing of the life course that the welfare state has created in this country where housing and education and income uh, and the NHS all rank as powerful factors helping us to stay healthy above all the individual choices that we might want to make about not smoking and not drinking too much alcohol and not sitting on our bottoms too long each day and so on. So things I might add to Anna is um, one barrier to people living well is to call them elderly because it sounds like they're a separate tribe or even species and of course that's not the case so just changing the language would help a, a little bit. Uh, we should all, as we go through life, but particularly as we get older, take up screening offers. The NHS does offer screening for several different conditions, all based on good evidence, and that's well worth doing. And then we should claim all the benefits that, we can, that we're entitled to. Are we preparing ourselves for old age? Well, that's an interesting topic because the evidence goes in both directions. Yes, we're living longer and there's less disability and morbidity. All the illnesses of particularly of later life are compressed into a shorter period at the end of life, which becomes rather hectic and expensive, but that's what's happening to us. But at the same time, it seems, at least in Europe, that as societies get happier, they are less interested in health. Or rather, there's a, a redefinition of healthiness in terms of consumption. Eat, drink and be merry is the slogan of ageing populations in Europe as it becomes more affluent. Um, and happiness alters perceptions of need for healthcare in quite significant ways. So that you get, for example, delayed response to symptoms and late diagnosis of, uh, particularly of cancers. We don't know what the economic recession is going to do to the health of our population, the baby boomer population. Uh, it might actually be beneficial in strange ways to some people, just as it's harmful to others. And then we have to factor in the class-related epidemic of obesity and diabetes, uh, which may come along and reverse all of the benefits gained in the smoothing out of the life course uh, with, the, with the welfare state. The last question that you put to us was, are families having the right conversations at the right time uh, to support older members? And, what, and my question would be, what's a right conversation uh, when it's at home? And uh, is it about property? Because lots of conversations do seem to be about property. Or is it about preferences, advanced directives and care plans, uh, and, and, and so on? Um, just a couple more more points. Uh, the ageing population is blamed for the rising costs of the health service. It isn't true, We've known for two decades at least, uh, that this isn't the case. Uh, it's, it's a scapegoating activity. What are the views of general practitioners? We can talk about those later, but general practitioners tend not to focus on diseases. So if you say dementia, well, they might do something about that. But if you say there's something going wrong with somebody's thinking, with their emotion and with their physical capability, that triad of losses that occur in later life, that's something you can get your, your teeth into, as it were, and work on. Um, the elderly in the community are seen as a problem that has to be solved by campaigning means. And the example I like to give of this is loneliness, which is now a campaigning target. There should be less loneliness in society, which of course is true. Uh, and finally, dementia, which um, we're, we're all frightened about. You can't really uh, forget something these days without somebody trying to take you to a memory clinic. <laughs> it, it, it's been over, oversold as a problem. Um, which is distressing because actually you can't do very much about it except adapt to it, accommodate to it as the disability that it is. And I just want to finish on one example of that. If you get lost in a place where people know who you are and what you're up to, 
they'll probably get you back where you want to be. But if you are in a place that you don't know and where people don't know you and you end up wondering if you can cross a motorway, then you're wandering and you're a problem. The first situation is a social response to the problem. The second situation is a highly medicalized response to it. We have to get the balance better, I think. Thank you, Steve. Lots of interesting points there. Thinking about the role of the welfare state in its broadest sense, posing questions around cuts to the health care service itself, um, rising demand, um, but also the role of campaign organisations. And Mike, you intervened as a campaign organisation in quite an unprecedented way into the NHS and social care debate only uh, a few weeks ago, referring to a humanitarian crisis. Can you say a little bit more about how you see the role of your organisation in relation to health and social care in this country and more broadly on the issues that have been picked up already this evening? Absolutely. <clears throat> Absolutely. So, I mean, I think two of the you know, very important statistics, one is my version of Anna's is that one in three people born today will live to be 100, or one in two, I've not heard it framed around, around girls specifically, but it's, that's an extraordinary thing. But it's also um, uh, very interesting that 70% of bed days in hospitals are occupied by frail elderly people with multiple conditions. And actually that's also, um, as we live longer and hopefully live well, we'll also be living with more things uh, wrong with us. Um, and it's about how we handle that situation. I just want to tell you a short story about two ladies that I met in uh, Plymouth that I think both illustrate the challenge and the opportunity. Um, and um, I was taken, um, Jane is a Red Cross volunteer in Plymouth. Uh, she's been a volunteer for about five years. She herself is about 70, but very fit and active and enjoying volunteering. And, um, uh, you know, kind of as we drove to see, um, uh, I was confused which, one, which way around it is, as Jane, as Jane drove me to, to, to meet Carol, um, the, you know, she was saying, why do I, I'm not sure why I keep on doing this. You know, why do I keep volunteering? But, and she, as we talked about it, she said, but I just enjoy it so much. Um, and here's a 70-year-old saying how much she enjoyed it. And everyone is so kind. Um, and that sense of purpose that you could just feel coming through from her. Um, and then I arrived at the door. Um, and, um, you know, Carol came to the door, opened the door, and she said, uh, oh, you're a, you're a star. And I thought she was talking to me. But she was talking to, talking to Jane. Um, quite rightly, too. Um, and, um, but Car Carol's story was that she had... Um, she had fallen, so she had, she, was, um, she had breathing problems, she had oxygen um, in the home, um, she uh, had ulcers on her leg and um, was a bit wobbly on her legs um, in terms of prone to fall. She was in her mid-70s and she had fallen um, and had lain on the floor uh, for a couple of hours um, until the neighbours realised one morning that the curtains hadn't opened um, and in fact therefore ended up breaking in to find out you know, what had happened, why, wasn't, why hadn't the curtains been drawn. Um, Carol's husband has dementia and is in a home. So in fact, in terms of, so um, uh, Carol is actually a carer herself in a way, certainly cares for somebody, um, even though he's not with her. And her family were um, far flung, they weren't, they, weren't, they weren't local. So there she was, you know, uh, socially isolated, worried about her husband, has fallen, Thankfully, the neighbours feel some sense of mutuality and community and are ready to um, spot that the curtains haven't been drawn and then, and then break in. As a result of the fall, um, uh, uh, Carol had to go into hospital and spent several, several weeks in hospital um, to uh, be treated for, uh, on up for her hips and to recover from that. During which time, what the Red Cross was able to do, Jane went to visit her in hospital on the ward to talk to her about um, what the situation was at home uh, what, she would be, what, what, what would she like to be able to do when she got home? You know, how would we be able to play a role in helping her get back on her feet again? Um, the advantage of that for, um, for Carol is the sense of somebody cares for her, uh, somebody's concerned about her welfare, um, and actually our, what we build into the way in which we operate is a thing called the three goals approach. We try and establish with each person we're working with, what would you like to be able to do? Not what's wrong with you, what would you like to be able to do? And so she'd like to be able to go out again, out into the community to get on a bus, to go to the shops uh, and to do the things that she used to do. She'd also like to be able to go and visit her husband. And so 
uh, Jane's job was to facilitate how that, how that would happen. So accompany her home, visit her, build a rapport with her. And of course, the challenge then is, um, as uh, Carol recovers and gets back on her feet again, is how to, because um, Carol's biggest worry was then that Jane, because we're, we're about helping people recover from a crisis. We're not about long-term befriending. So how, what, who would help her when our support came to the end, at, at the end of 10 to 12 weeks? And so actually there was a whole thing about how do we exit well as well, having connected Carol up to the things she wants to be able to do, other longer-term befriending support. And so that's what we were able to do. I met um, you know, Carol halfway through that story. Um, but I think what it illustrates is some, some really important things. Actually, is about that living with multiple conditions, that vulnerability, that isolation. Um, I'm sure that technology can play a role in terms of use of iPads, access to information, and so on. It shows the role of volunteering, purposeful volunteering, both for an, elderly, el an older woman herself, a 70-year-old, who is actually fit and active and able to therefore make a contribution, and therefore actually playing a real part. So it, um, you know, but it also shows the importance of community and mutuality in terms of actually helping nip things, these things in the bud. It's not, a, just about stat, it's not just about fixing people up and statutory solutions. It's about how we all support people through the human contact that I think is essential to everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Neil, Mike mentioned the role of technology and how we can live happier, healthier, longer lives. From your perspective as a head of a health tech firm, where would you sit in this? So I think the, uh, clearly technology can play a role, but it only plays a role here. And I think everything that we've heard so far this evening um, is fundamental to um, living uh, healthier for longer uh, in the way that we want to live. Um, we are a technology company. We've been in the healthcare space for 100 years. We started in diagnostic imaging. Uh, we're still in diagnostic imaging, but we're also very clear that we have a role to play in supporting people to live longer lives, healthier lives. Um, and I think your example is a great example. Um, I've got a similar example. My mother-in-law, she did fall. Um, uh, she wasn't so lucky. She did wind up in hospital. She was there for about three months, um, during which time a, a helper went in and turned her heating off during a very cold winter, unfortunately. So sadly, the, the house was completely flooded when the pipes burst. She never made it back to her own home. Um, and she's now, through that process, sadly become institutionalised in a care home. And it's a, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a sad story. But there is technology out there that could have predicted from her movements that she was becoming more frail, and we could have intervened at that point uh, before it happened. So it set off a whole sort of um, sequence of events, and it's that technology um, coupled with the right care system, coupled with the right um, care pathways that can make a difference in the way that we uh, support people to live healthier lives for longer. Um, there's a whole, um, there's a whole um, uh, gamut of things that we can take from the acute sector where we can monitor patients in an acute environment and provide early warnings of conditions getting worse. We can take that technology into a home environment and support carers to intervene at an appropriate time. But it does require that whole system to be wrapped around the individual as well at the same time. So it, it can't solve all the problems, but it can be a huge facilitator in supporting the kind of uh, environments that, uh, that we've heard about. So, lots of food for thought there. Um, I, think, I think if Simon Stevens were in the room, he'd think, this is great. We've got full endorsement for this kind of five-year forward view that I set out a good few years ago now. Um, we're, we're talking everything coming out of health. We're, we're talking about community. We're talking about housing. We're talking about wider welfare. We're talking about the role of technology and volunteering. How do we help to change people's expectations around how to live well in, in, term, in the sense that you've described this evening, when so immediately the debate typically goes to, how am I going to afford social care, a, a, a rightful concern? How am I going to get to hospital when you know, I'm isolated, I haven't got good transport links or, or so on? Um, will, I, will I experience um, painful, very challenging, conditions such as dementia, which was mentioned earlier. How do we help to shift people's mindset into this much broader way of thinking? Neil. 
I think, I think we need to have a very um, uh, honest debate as well in terms of where, where we are as a society. Um, we undertook a study, the, the Future Health Index, a global study. We interviewed 25,000 people. 60% of those people said that they did take care of their own health and they were actively involved um, in managing their own well-being. Um, so that's 60%. We asked the same question then to uh, healthcare professionals. 80% of healthcare professionals said that their patients didn't look after themselves and didn't do that. So there is a, there is a contradiction between what we say we do and what we actually do. Um, so I think there's a, there's a very, very open and honest debate to be had within society about, you know, are we really up for um, uh, this change? Again, technology can support, but again, I think we need to be very, very open with ourselves in terms of where we are. Steve, how clinicians help to have that dialogue with their patients and the public? I, mean, I was just wondering how they knew, actually. You know, our example of, you know, 80% don't look after themselves. How did they know that? It was their answer to the question. So it's, yeah. it's, uh, it may be that the person who says I am looking after myself is right and the professionals are wrong. Sorry, what was your question? <laughs> how, how, as, how as clinicians can we start to have um, this more informed dialogue with patients? I, I, I think the dialogues go on all the time but they may not be connected together. Uh, the, the, the nice thing about the NHS's primary care services is that people still see the same doctors as they did before, often over long periods of time. I know that's decreasing. I know the continuity of care is declining, but it's still there. And it does mean there are snippets of information, brief exchanges, sometimes longer discussions, happening already. The question is, how do you link those together? And of course, interestingly, our technology solution is one that actually captures numbers rather than words. But how do we connect those things together within the technology so that you can see the story evolving or not evolving? Because lots of people don't want to talk about too much uh, towards the end of their lives. Now, I think that's a really interesting thing to see developing over, over the, uh, the next decade or so. Do you want a response to your provocative statement about Simon Stevens and the Five Year Four Review? Why not? Um, great idea, where's the money? I'm going to come back and, the, to that and where's question. the time, actually? Because the two things that are, that are missing from the experimental development work going on in the health service at the moment is a, is a sense of real time, an expectation of, of a, uh, results being achieved in two to three years, which can't possibly come from anybody who actually works in the service because it doesn't work like that. And the other is that you can do it with less and less money and you can be more and more produ productive. And that's not right either. Mike, I'm going to come to you, potentially, first on the role of organisations in civil society or NGOs or other organisations in, in help, helping to shape this dialogue, but also then around the money question. Yeah, well, so I think the, the key thing about many voluntary organisations um, and civil societies are actually we look at people as whole people. So an, another little story was, very briefly, would be visiting a lady in Bradford who had fallen, uh, broken her hip, was recovering, I sat with our volunteer who sat with, sitting for her, with her for an hour, during which time the uh, physiotherapist came in, uh, knocked on the door, and was there for five minutes. He was really polite and helpful. He checked that she could walk to the kitchen and walk up, the, walk up and down the stairs, and then he left. He didn't do anything. In turn, he did his job, but he wasn't engaging with the lady around what would she like to be able to do, um, and actually what support did she need in order to do that. And I think that there's an obligation on all professionals at every stage in the pathway to actually start to engage more with the person rather than just the bit that seems they are dealing with that, that happens to be wrong with them. Uh, we need to break free of the silos between health and social care and then the clinical silos um, within health and invest properly in prevention. You know, the, there are so many, I think Steve, you were starting to touch on the you, know, you start right at the beginning about the things that enable people to live healthily and then when something goes wrong, they start to lose their hearing. That's the beginnings of social isolation. We know the consequence of losing hearing, social isolation, loneliness is, you know, um, you know depression for, uh, can be around depression, but it can also be about more, more, a, more GP attendances, more A&E attendances. You know, we need to try and intervene early to establish virtuous circles that get help to root the support we provide in the person and what they need at that time so that they can determine their own pathways and destiny rather than relying on the state. 
And how do we afford that? Well, I mean, um, I know to have quite, you know, the whole thing about how you make the business case for pre pre prevention is genuinely really, really difficult um, because you're trying to prove what didn't happen. Um, and that's quite difficult. And we have done a number of evaluations, and I will be honest with you, parts of what we've done show the, actually that the, um, the investor save case. So in terms of, for example, when we place um, some people in an A&E department who, where there's a frail elderly person arrives, nobody at home, um, and we run those services between midday and midnight, um, and actually um, the doctors and nurses will end up admitting someone just because they're worried about the situation at home, um, even though they're clinically well enough to go home. What we can do is go, we can take responsibility for the discharge, um, transport, night sitting service, make sure the food is in the fridge, the heating's on, um, all, of that, all, all of that stuff. Now that pays, it, pays for itself because you avoid an admission. Some of the other stuff is more ambiguous in terms of shortening hospital stays because they just get filled up with other people. But we have to root it back in the patient well-being and some of these things are not expensive in the scale of things. And, over, and it's about over what time horizon we're prepared to look at the returns. Because at the moment, you know, the NHS and the social care are in a situation where they, they're looking for returns in you know, 12 to 24 months. Otherwise, you know, it's the distant future. And somehow we've got to reframe this. And you know, the phraseology that we used at the time you know, has been politicized, and we re very much regret that. But actually, what we do need is to acknowledge that the pressure of an aging society with new, new drugs, new technologies that quite rightly people want to slice off, and budget constraints means we've got a, a problem. And we need to talk more honestly and openly about that challenge, and any government would have that problem. Anna, your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I very much agree that, um, you know, there, there is an issue about what we're spending the money on, and the focus tends to be on disease, it tends to be reactive, and it tends to be, um, uh, you know, in a crisis situation. That is um, uh, the focus, and even though we've talked about it for a long time, for a need to do things that are more preventative and in this space it is simple things like aids and adaptations in people's homes um, you know an adapted home can delay admission to a residential care by up to four years um, and the statistics around the cost to the NHS of falls if we can prevent those it's about 500 million per annum the the numbers are there and they do stack up but unfortunately it is um, uh, the, the money often is getting spent in the wrong place. And I think there is also this um, sort of, I think, a bit of a misnomer about it is age. It isn't actually age. It is, um, we are, we're not treating old people, we're treating um, their diseases. And I think if we had more focus on trying to maximise people's function, maximise people's quality of life, and that includes at the end of their life, um, then we would have a very different model of care. And quite a lot of the people who are getting admitted towards the end of their life, perhaps they are um, quite frail, um, you know, that can be an appropriate admission. What is then happening is that they are inappropriately staying longer than necessary because of the lack of um, supported return to home, lack of suitable housing, lack of social care provision. Um, because there's no focus on function and maintaining function and, and rehabilitation whilst they are in hospital, actually their chances of ever returning to the former situation, that declines very rapidly. So I really think that there needs to be, it, it's, it's less about, I mean, of course there are issues about lack of funding, particularly in social care. But there is a, still a real challenge that we're not spending the money on the right things. And actually the reality is that much of the growth in, in health spending has been on treating new things, new diseases with new technologies and, and that is where the money goes. And I think too much, we, it's too easy to just use the shorthand, it's, it's about the ageing population and it isn't. Um, and I think we really need to get away from that and actually be promoting, you know, much more positive about how many people in later life have very good quality of life, are functioning well, some people are living with you know, chronic illness but are still maintaining a good quality of life and if well supported in the right environment can do, do very well still. I think that's an excellent point to turn to the audience for quest your questions. I'm going to take three or four. Please tell, you, tell us who you are and where you're from and then we'll put those to our panel. So we've got the gentleman right at the back. Thank you. And then a lady here and then a gentleman here. Ian Dodds, uh, Ian Dodds Consulting. Um, 
One, uh, we, we talk a lot um, about uh, what, the importance of what people eat, what people drink, and the exercise that people do. In more recent times, I've read in the newspapers of research which indicates that getting in the right amount of sleep is actually uh, very important, both in terms of uh, the length of your life and your health and well-being. And I just wondered if you had any comments on getting the right amount of sleep. Interesting. Lady down here. Hi, I'm Jennifer Taylor, and I'm a pre-baby boomer. I spent this morning with a group of 20 people from our local University of the Third Age, whose ages range from 66 to 86. <laughs> And with a walking group, we were planning the five to 10 mile walks that we'll be doing in 2017. Um, and it's a community group. It's really supportive. It is self-financing. Um, and I'd just like to give a plug for it in terms of the sorts of processes and the sorts of support that can be around for us elderly which is, again, I don't like the word. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, hi, I'm Carl Allen. I'm a 63-year-old pensioner. I play five-a-side football with 20-year-olds. And you should take a look. <laughs> <laughs> I am actually 63 years old. But my point is, between the ages of 50 and 60, I tail off on work and tailed up on exercise. So I ended up in a situation. I, I was only working for 24 hours a week, and I was spending 16 hours spread over the week exercising. And what I'm saying is that do we or do we not need that sort of adjustment to not only just get fit as we age, but to carry us to a healthy 100? I fully intend to live to 100 and more. <laughs> So I think two related questions there, one about, about sleep and one about exercise and how um, potentially if we're talking about extending our working lives, how the, those can interfere with one another perhaps, and then the role of kind of being involved in active community organisations. Um, so just thoughts from the panel, um, this kind of working age I think is, is particularly interesting. Are we asking people to work for longer? Are we asking them just to shift into non-paid work? Or how do, how do you think we need to kind of fit that into kind of retirement and, and pensionable age and, and that kind of um, uh, more institutional setup that is ne not necessarily as flexible to individual choice as we might often wish it to be? Maybe I could start with you, Anna. Yeah, I mean, um, certainly I, I think a hundred year life has got to look very different. Um, and there's a great book um, uh, which I can give a plug for uh, by a couple of academics at London Business School, which is called The Hundred Year Life. And they talk there about having to rethink. So instead of the three stage life of educate, career, retire, um, that uh, you know we will have to have different a different balance, and that as well as investing in our sort of tangible assets like finances and um, and and housing, we need to invest in intangible assets like our health. So you probably made one of the best investments you could in your fifties to um, you know give yourself the opportunity to actually continue to be economically productive well into your later life, and actually maybe actually working only half of your time may uh, turn out to have been um, whether it by necessity or, or choice. So I do think it means that we have to rethink uh, work-life balance um, and need to look at um, how we fluctuate and change the balance um, over time. And, um, you know, I think um, uh, the only, I was otherwise going to comment on U3A, but I might, I might leave that if you want to come to any of the other panel. But I mean, I think just the whole thing about staying active, staying connected, learning new things, um, teaching others, um, you know, it's volunteer-led, the U3A, there's other examples of similar community organisations where um, they're just giving great opportunities for people to, you know, uh, have community and to keep connected and to keep both physically and mentally healthy and active. Um, and, you know, I think um, that is um, a great asset that is going on out there, as you say, um, uh, in a voluntary and community-led way, which is excellent. I should just say before 
before coming to Neil, there is evidence to point out, and Resolution Foundation has done a lot of analysis around this, that, um, that there is going to be an, an intergenerational transfer of wealth uh, away from younger people and with rising ho house prices out of reach for many. Do we, do we feel that this will always be an option, uh, or potentially a diminishing option, for younger people as they're struggling to pay their mortgages off or even get onto the housing ladder and are pe facing rental bills out of their, their pensions later in life? My children are doing the best job possible at redistributing my wealth. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 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 um. I have two at university and one at home still, so uh, yeah, they're, they're doing a bloody good job of that. I think the other piece then about the 100-year life we were talking about earlier on as well, um, my wife and I got married and we both said, till death is do part. I don't think we were thinking of 100 years um, <laughs> when we did that as well, so maybe it has... Um, is this actually... Be yeah, oh, well. <laughs> That's my wife and my mother-in-law are upset. Um, so I think, there is a, yeah, I think there are some fairly profound questions when you start talking about the 100-year um, life. Um, uh, there are some people talking about the 150 year life um, and there are even some I've, I've heard in Japan they're actually talking about the fact now that you know why in fact do we need to die now in, in fact that and that's a uh, that's a, a discussion that's actually uh, live at the moment but it, it's a it's a it's a profound question in terms of what does it mean for society and what does it mean for us and you know I'd like to be part of that problem at some point or at least that discussion. Um, I, I would like to come back on the question about sleep if we want to pick that one up now. Um, sleep is a really interesting um, area. Um, it is uh, incredibly underserved uh, in terms of um, uh, um, solutions for sleep disorders in the UK. Um, there was a piece of work done a couple of years back called the Atlas of Variation, just looking at variation across different geographies, the postcode lottery. Um, and sleep has the widest variation in terms of service provision across the system. Um, uh, we do work uh, with people that have sleep disorders um, and we do find profound improvements in health uh, can be delivered through solving that. But the, 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 the postcode lottery around sleep is incredible. Some commissioners uh, commission that service and some just don't. Um, and it's a, it, it, it's a fundamental challenge um, for us. I can get to the more questions. Well, just one, one second. So from the re research we've done around uh, loneliness and social isolation and, and your question about, you know, won't financial constraints kind of intervene, but surely you know, what we found in, in that work is a, lot of, is a lot around identity. Actually, identity and purpose are key. And actually, in one sense, whether you're, if you're fit, whether you're working or you're volunteering, depending on what you can afford, and that means something to you, then perhaps that, that is the key. More questions? Brilliant. So, down the front, this gentleman here, this gentleman here. And then we'll go all the way to the other side. Yeah, that lady at the front. Hello, this is probably maybe directed at Mike. Um, just interesting your comment firstly on, on um, prevention, you know, making the business case. I'm sure we should try and get the debate beyond making a business case for prevention in the sense that it's so blindingly obvious that, you know, we ought to be spending or, or investing or however you want to describe it more in that area. And it just led me to a, th a thought that you know, I'm sure your organisation may already be active in, which is linking volunteering to prevention and the role that volunteers could play in healthcare education, which would go a long way down the path of, you know, being a, enabling us to invest in prevention without having to worry, uh, uh, you know, without having to sort of be asking for billions from the government to do it. Uh, Jim Dalton, I'm a designer. Um, I'd love to know uh, who you as a panel think is responsible for the health and well-being of an individual. And that lady there, just in the middle. Thank you. Um, I'm Maggie Winchcombe from Years Ahead, and I just wanted to pick up on a, a point that Anna made, and then, um, is it Mike from the Red Cross? So, um, the, the point that aids in adaptations and modifying environments can be often quite crucial and critical for people to, to be able to go back home and live safely and happily there. Uh, but the point of identity, I think, then it kind of is a, a bit of a, a stumbling block, because so many of these aids and adaptations look so bloody awful yeah. and and it does I think people don't want to be identified with these products that actually are badges of their 
incapacity. So what I want to see is how we can positively move forward with managing ageing in, in a creative and, and positive way. Technologies and, and products are out there, they make the difference, but actually people resist going there. But they don't need to. <laughs> Excellent questions. So first of all, thinking about prevention and the role of volunteering in that and, and the role of education. And then maybe it's not the responsibility to be outsourcing um, the, the health or prevention thereof to others. Maybe it's your own personal responsibility to find that out for yourself and to take good care of yourself. And then finally around adaptation and how we design ways to make sure that people don't have to feel so visibly um, identified in terms of their, their needs and can, to, to speak to other things that we've mentioned earlier, um, live on and, and be happy people and accepted and valued as people in society regardless of what adaptations they need. So, Steve, maybe we come to you first. Yes, I, there's so many questions I've completely lost the plot. Actually. Which one do you want to take? <laughs> I can, We've got adaptation, who's responsible? Prevention. Who's resp oh, well, prevention's easy because there's nothing new. We know what to do. We are actually doing it. Loss of prevention of heart disease is having a beneficial effect on brain function and development. So we're beginning to see a downturn in the proportion of older people developing any form of dementia across industrialised societies. And that's because we've been working hard on, on heart disease prevention. So I think prevention, in a sense, is very easy. We know what to do. Uh, doing it is another matter. Uh, the, other, the other point that struck me was who, who is responsible for an individual's health and well-being? And I think the answer is that them and us. Actually, I think, yes, of course I'm responsible for what I do, but other people have every right to uh, advise me, even if I don't like it, if, there is a, if I'm going to be using up communal resources. Uh, so I completely um, behind what you're suggesting around the role of volunteers, but, but also all sorts of other people as well who are reaching out for other purposes. So, you know, when um, uh, when fire team, when a fire, somebody from the fire service goes to do a um, look at the smoke detectors in some, somebody's house, they also look wh at whether actually the carpet is uh, isn't properly pinned down, whether you know the person living there is likely to trip up. It's all about all of the things that we can do. There's an important program within the, I sit on the prevention board for the, for the, the five year forward view. Um, and um, you know, there are programs within that around how every health professional, when they go to visit someone in their home, could also be um, engaging in health education around obesity, around smoking, and starting to try and influence and nudge people to live differently as well as treating whatever the issue is. So I think that's about all of our responsibilities and, and, and yes, volunteers can get behind that and we've experimented at different times around could volunteers help take blood pressure tests or could they you know, take pulses and so on. What they do do is spot problems early um, and when they sense a problem they ring up that, you know, the relevant people to get help and in that sense it's all about prevention. I couldn't agree with you more about the stigma associated with these products that advertise yourselves as, you know, I am old and <laughs> decrepit and that's why I've got one of these things rather than this is the thing that's enabling me to live a really exciting life. So we can all help with that. Yes. Co and commercial so technology, yeah. technology can as well, Neil. Yeah, absolutely. So I, I, th I think it, it's, a fundamental, um, it's a fundamental question and it's not just about people um, living with conditions in later life. Um, we have done quite a bit of work in terms of creating health programmes um, for people living with cardiac conditions that can affect people in, in multiple stages of life. Um, we have a uh, health watch which measures uh, a bunch of different things, um, uh, tracks that data, supports the individual then with programmes that help them to live a healthier life. What you do not want is to be wearing a watch that says I have a heart condition. So we've worked very, very hard to try to come up with something that looks like it's a piece of fashion jewellery because that's what people want to wear. They don't want to be associated with that tag. So I think it's a fundamental point. I don't think as, as technology providers we've got all of the answers yet, but as a, as a consumer brand as well as a healthcare brand, we're very, very aware of the fact that you have to have a great products that people actually want to use um, and don't give you that stigma and don't give you that attachment. 
Yeah, music to my ears, the Centre for Ageing Better, we're doing work on um, AIDS and adaptations where we want to see in the future many more people having adapted homes and it's absolutely clear from people with lived experience and you only have to go and do a bit of mystery shopping on, on websites to know that this stuff is very unattractive. They retail from industrial sites. This is not stuff that you would want to build into your home. And yet, they're talking to practitioners as well, um, like occupational therapists, there are adaptations which are on the market which are actually just mainstream things like fitting ovens at um, um, eye level, taps that are easier to turn, um, door handles that are easier to turn. So we're very interested in not only gathering the evidence um, and influencing more of the sort of statutory and, um, and, and healthcare side of, of putting aids in adaptations, but actually we think the big win is to go and change the market and that means retailers, designers and others. And um, uh, so we're at the beginning of thinking how we do that. So anybody here in the room or out there who would like to come and work with us on really shifting that so um, uh, that there are attractive products that can really um, change people's lives. Yeah. Great. Some more questions, particularly someone who's feeling doom and gloomy about it. I'm very <laughs> impressed at the degree of optimism. <laughs> <laughs> <So>. <coughs> not sure. No, no, I'm not feeling gloomy. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right then. All right then. Well, if we can have an edge of gloom, then this gentleman here, lady at the back, and then right in the corner at the back. Uh, my, my name's David Elliott. I'm a trustee of the Bering Foundation. Um, I mean, the title is about better health, but I'd be intrigued to hear thoughts also beyond physical health about the concept of promoting well-being amongst uh, I'll try and avoid the word the elderly, I'm one of them. Uh, I, this is of interest only because the Bering Foundation has been funding, with a lot of other people for a number of years, a program of um, engaging fourth, fourth age, people whose, whose quality of life is impaired by, by age, uh, in arts activities, in participation, in, 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 in a range of artistic activity. And, the, and there's a lot of uh, suggestion and anecdotal indication as well as a certain amount of research to suggest that in terms of giving a, a sense of purpose and in terms of social contact this can be really quite a powerful uh, ingredient in improving the quality of life and the well-being of elderly people. Hi, um, I just wanted to talk a bit about um, older people in the workplace and particularly in paid work and there's been mention of sort of stigma and negativity around the word elderly in particular. Um, I'm just wondering what the panel think um, the world of work and industries in particular that value youth and um, how they need to change to make um, living longer actually living better. And then right in the corner. Hi, my name is Sherry Clark. I work for an organization called Happiness Works. Um, I've spent the last 10 years in the NHS and um, the two speakers prior to me have sort of um, covered the area I wanted to ask you about. I um, work at the moment talking to organizations around the world around well-being at work. And a lot of the people I've been speaking to and even this afternoon have been um, talking about the effects of stress in their working lives. And many of them are in their late 20s, early 30s. We're talking about the kind of illnesses that we wouldn't have historically seen until much later on in a working life. And I am extremely uh, pessimistic about the way work is um, progressing for people who are not necessarily starting their careers, but you know, in the early stages of their careers with none of the options that some of us ha had. Um, it's very little at the moment around flexible working, even though we talk about it, very little around um, work-life balance. So I'm particularly interested in what happens to people who break down um, mental health problems at an early age, middle age, what happens to your physical health later on in life and the outcomes for people with mental health problems generally. So, yeah. Fantastic questions, thank you. All kind of centred around this wider notion of well-being. 
um, and the role of employers and then potentially um, the lady's last question I'm particularly interested in the aspect of wh where we're seeing a um, erosion of the quality of work in particular rise of low paid jobs rise of insecure employment how this is potentially going to be an ever increasing problem but also one that has an ever increasing um, socioeconomic dimension to it which is going to further compound socioeconomic um, health inequalities um, so um, Steve again you, you mentioned that around social determinants of health when we were speaking earlier how do you interpret the kind of broader well-being notion again particularly potentially from a clinical perspective I, speaking clinically, I think it's quite difficult to use the term well-being. It, it has so many potential different meanings. I'm not sure which one is right. But if you turn it into quality of life, which is a bit reductionist uh, to do that, but it's at least easier to hang on to. And we know what determines quality of life in people as we get older. Um, and part of it is having disabilities dealt with. Your quality of life rises as your disabilities are reduced. So it's identifying and acting on those that matters, whatever stage of life it, it, it may be. Um, I don't know enough about employment to say, but I can, I can see there's an argument around a sort of precariat workforce, ageing, and what happens to them. And Well, what would be a good answer to that? A universal basic income, maybe? Everybody get out on the allotment? Uh, because you've got to get your vegetables from somewhere. <laughs> and, and Neil, I mean, you're a major employer as well. What are you doing with your workforce? Yeah, I, I was thinking that through just in terms of um, how do I make this not sound like a, a, an ad to come and work for Philips, but we had, a, we had a town hall meeting yesterday and we finished with 10 minutes of stretching exercises afterwards. And um, yeah, I was a bit worried about the cars as they went. Uh, well, it was the cars that were passing on the A3 as we were doing that. I was more worried about sort of uh, wondering what the hell was going on in the office. So, um, and I attended a, a, a meeting on uh, Tuesday with some of our engineers, and they had an hour on hydration and nutrition. So, so as a responsible employer, I can say what we're doing um, as Philips to tackle some of these issues because we believe they are important. Um, what I can't say is, of course, that it, it's universal across all em employers. Um, but it's, it's certainly something for us, you know, we track it, we measure it, um, uh, we measure the engagement of our staff in our business and we believe it's important that we do try to offer flexible working because there is a, you know, there's a, 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 a whole population out there and if you're not flexible in the way that you actually offer employment to people then you do preclude yourself from attracting talent from different sections of, uh, of society. Yeah, um, obviously um, mental health conditions and musculoskeletal conditions are the leading causes of people to fall out of work. Um, and um, I think one of the things that we have observed is that for people over 50, the current work support programme is very ineffective in supporting people back into work. Um, and for those people, that's an, a really significant problem if they don't get back into work um, um, for their longer li their later life um, sort of well-being and outcomes. So I think it's really important that those issues are identified and those barriers that are often health barriers or caring, there's lots of things um, going on there and that um, programmes are, are, are tailored to, to tackle those things. But obviously, ideally as well, employers are more proactive in um, identifying and supporting people, adapting roles if they do have um, physical um, conditions um, and certainly we're working very closely with um, business in the community who have got a number of employers already signed up to age at work um, who are looking at the sorts of practices that they need to um, implement in order to support um, older workers and um, uh, we are sort of helping to build the evidence base about what works around um, age-friendly work practices um, amongst employers and we'd be very pleased for other companies who might be interested in um, joining that to really spearhead um, that movement uh, around um, pr um, supporting people uh, to work for longer in terms of employers and business. And do you think we need to regulate or somehow force firms to take on those responsibilities? Um, it's a very good question. I think that um, there's a very strong case why employers and businesses should pay attention to this. I mean, basically, they're going to face um, 
labour and skills shortages in many in, um, industries. There just are not enough younger workers coming through to replace those that are retiring. Um, so there's a pretty strong economic imperative for them. Um, there are other sort of reasons as well around um, older consumers, uh, making sure that they have workers who can relate to uh, their um, consumers um, and, uh, 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 and that as well. Um, but obviously, if there is ageism, and that may be in terms of uh, recruitment uh, or that, you know, organisations should look very carefully at their data about career progression, are they investing as much in the training and development of their older workers as their systematic bias in performance appraisal? And so I think there is an, you know, it is, it is also a, um, a, an issue of, um, t for employers to consider whether there are things around discrimination as they would with gender and race that they should look at age. But I think actually um, we're not at the stage necessarily that we would say that there needs to be regulation. I think it is about um, businesses seeing the case for this and um, uh, adopting the practices that we will hopefully be promoting. Neil, your response? Yeah, I just think, uh, sorry, do you want to go? No, no, no. Uh, no there's just one point on pensions really. I think one of the biggest challenges we see um, a core of our business is, is, is radiology and the way that the pension system is set up at the moment which discourages any higher earners from working beyond the age of about 57, 58 um, I think is a fundamental challenge certainly for the health system where we see um, yeah, a lot of clinicians choosing to actually take uh, early retirement um, and exposing the health system to a, to a huge problem having invested significantly in the training there's a huge disincentive to carry on working. Just building on Anna's point, I mean, as we're looking at our relaunch of our inclusion and diversity policy and approach and strategy, um, you know, ageing will be an important part of that alongside all the other uh, characteristics. And I think some of the ideas that are also being floated around at the moment from some of the carers' organisations around things like carers' leave, uh, as well as just to think about maternity leave and paternity leave, that actually those are very important concepts for how we, um, uh, together as a society, rise to the challenge of, of supporting people through older age. Well, sadly, we've run out of time, so we'll have to wrap up this session. And thank you all again for coming and for your excellent questions. I'm sorry if we didn't get a chance to make it to yours. But um, thank you again to our partners, Philips, who have kindly supported this evening and um, who welcome you to drinks downstairs in our Benjamin Franklin room. Um, I think what has um, inspired me so much is the positivity and the sense of opportunity and also it's very rare that you hear a positive statistic about dementia so I'm very pleased to hear <laughs> that by tackling heart disease we've had that knock-on effect so um, I think it's in um, yeah n n lots of hard work going on in our in our research our excellent research uh, in the UK and um, I encourage you all to find those nuggets of optimism so that you continue to live happy, healthier lives, knowing that you will be free to do so if you set up the conditions in earlier in your, in your life and throughout. So many thanks again to our speakers. <laughs> and do join us for drinks downstairs.